don't. It's the lessons learned. And I probably everyone that's been past the lessons learned, uh, people you try to work with and it didn't go well. Um, but it, really early on in your campaign in the research stages, you need to figure out who you want your allies to be. Because if you, when you ask yourself, if you figure out who your target is, and you ask yourself, okay, this is my target, and you ask, and you ask yourself if you're affected by them, um, you're going to come up with a long, long list of people, organizations, uh, unions, like different unions. You're not just going to say things like unions are affected by it. You're going to have to break it down to like which local, which union is affected by them and which ones are likely possibilities for you to be able to work with, which you're going to get to in a second. Um, if you don't want to ever start reaching out to allies. It's this like last minute thought, this like 911 mentality. It's like, oh, our campaign would be more legitimate if we had a labor person here. That's not how or why you reach out to, to labor. They're a part of the, they're a part of like, you see that the relationship with them is going to help you achieve their goal. But you don't want to go to an already busy group of people who are campaigning on lots of things and be like, hi, you don't know me, you should work with me. You start off by listening. you got to get to know the people that you want to work with. And so when you go to a community of people who are slightly different from you, who don't know who you are, and are mildly distrustful of you, because to be honest, the environmental movement does not have the best reputation for working well with others at all, um, as a whole, um, you need to start off by asking, like, asking leading questions. Asking open-ended questions to people, you know, what do they care about? What are they working on? How does this company impact them? What's going on in their community and what are their priorities be, uh, before you dive into uh, what, you're, what, what, what you're working on? You know, you want to share what you're working on, be transparent and honest, but you don't want to dive into a why they should work with you. You want to see how you can work together and mutually benefit um, each other. Um, on that note, I think maybe do you want to do that?
She left because she eats this one. <laughs> she actually did. Yeah. Solar farm. 
that we're looking at getting subsidized way out in Rockford, about 100 miles away. Okay, if we get the government to create this solar farm, okay, and wind farm, give it to you basically. They're going to pay for all of it. You know, that means you still get to make your money selling so selling electricity over to the East Coast. That's where it was going. Chicago didn't even get it. You still get to make your money selling that electricity over to the East Coast. And Midwest Generation, I mean, under the IBW, your workers, okay? If we can sit down and meet and figure out how many of your workers, we can completely replace all of their jobs with a job in this industry, you know? Then that means all your workers go over to the solar, the new solar farm, okay? And then Midwest Generation, you still get to sell electricity, so you still get to make money, you know? And you don't have to worry about fracking and all that other stuff. So now, IBW and Midwest Generation, which they thought this was impossible, but they was like, if you can do that, we'll make a deal with you to shut down the coal plants, if you can make that deal, which they're laughing, saying there's no way you're going to be able to make that deal. Okay, they didn't know we had a little bit of footwork already ready going in that direction, and we had told those people we could get Midwest Generation to agree to this, and the legislator, you know, well, you all push this through, and they were like, they're never going to agree to that. So we kind of had both sides of the field kind of pushed in both of those in both of those directions. Our, one of our problems was, I say, well, not dumbfounded and neutral, but we had Mayor Daly. <laughs> well, back on the winter right here. See we had Mayor Daly. All right. <laughs>
we started once the bourgeois people finally got tired and said, okay, we want to take some of you, you know, crazy people's ideas and try to go after this guy. But like, oh yeah, great. So we said, let's go after all this guy's social events. We went, no matter what he did, we started having people out there. He even had a bike ride, a benefit bike ride. You know, so we all showed up to the bike ride looking like the bourgeois suits and ties and stuff. And when it's time to ride the bikes, you know, we started putting biohazard suits on and gas masks. And people were like, man, he just hung out and ate our food and drank and they're about to do this. You know, then we found that he was having a, a job fair. We're like, we're going to get a booth at the job fair. You know what he saw? I don't know how he found out that was about to happen, but he canceled the job fair. Wow. He, he didn't want to do it. You know, and uh, then he started canceling other events. And then all of a sudden, someone said, funny that us and Rand were doing stuff, he called someone at Sierra Club, you know, and wanted to actually even have a discussion, you know, about this Clinton Powell ordinance, you know, and plus election time was coming up. And his constituents that all right likes, you know, have cars, did not know that the guy they like was actually supporting this, you know. So now Alderman Solis, you know, starts to move over this way. And once we had Alderman Solis over this way, then Mayor Daly decides he's going to come out of office. You know, oh, I'm going to retire. He's leaving. And then we had a whole Rahm Emanuel coming. <laughs> but Rahm Emanuel wanted to make the environmentalists happy, so he decided he's going to jump on board with this whole clean power ordinance thing, full blast. You know, so now now we're good and power this way. But now we had this executive person here. You know, which made it a lot easier for us to actually get you know um, some legislative pressure to get IBEW Midwest Gen to agree to this. And then Rami Manuel helped actually draft some of the, the legislation that we we're going to take to the, the House, you know. So when taking that to the House, the Illinois State House, all of a sudden, all these other politicians got excited of a victory with the cold class, because it was looking like that. The Manuel's on television saying, clean up or shut down. So now, all these other, everyone started wanting to take credit was shutting down the coal plant, which was great because now we didn't, all of a sudden we didn't have anybody here. Everybody everybody ended up wanting to be over here some kind of way but take their own credit. They didn't want the deal that was struck up. Other people started to struck up their <laughs> only deal with Midwest Generation to shut down that they drafted so they could actually take credit for that, you know. And that became a little bit of a cluster, but we knew we was in a good spot because we were just sitting there watching every, all these people fight for that victory, which means we didn't really have to, you know, do that much. But then they were getting nervous because they were tap dancing on certain issues, and now they're in a position where everybody over here on the legislative side, on both sides, were all saying, you guys have to shut down just which way we're going to go. No one was arguing that they could even stay there, you know. Can you give an example of who came forward with alternative proposals? Uh, the speaker of the House of <coughs> Michael Madigan, I believe it is Michael Madigan. He said that he did it's not. A governmental body. Yeah, it's a governmental body. His his alternative was he felt he was just trying to him and I don't think him and Ron get along, so it was like you know he wanted to cut that guy off and come up with his own solution. But his solution was actually something that we wanted anyway, but it was far worse. His solution was they were going to shut down and not get anything. You know, you, they get no coal, they get no solar plant, they get no, they get nothing, you know. He's going to shut them down, you know. But the problem is, once, if he, if he, if he kills Rom, uh, our, our plan with Rom, and he said, well, I'm going to push this one just to shut him down. Okay, now these people are about to be fighting all over again to stay alive, but they get nothing in return. You know, so then now Michael Madigan is looking like, okay, we may have to start organizing against Michael Madigan. We didn't want to go through. I mean, IBW, they were, they were real, they were almost like, they were, they did some real dirty things, man. When it comes to framing and messaging and stuff, you know, they would go get, like, Hispanic people that, and put them on, like, flyers saying, what are your neighbors? And none of them lived over there with the cold And they would just get these people and go on to brown communities and hand all these flyers out. And we'd have to try to find a way to tell all those people that no one knows who those people are, no one knows where these people work at, none of those people actually live there. They would always do that. Then they would pay people to show up to City Hall when we were having our hearings. So they could completely fill up all of City Hall so none of us activists could get in there. I remember I was supposed to speak at 11 o'clock in the morning. I got there at 6 and it was stacked with hard hats already that were busted in from all over the state of Illinois so none of us could be in. So they could sway no matter what was said in those hearings. They could sway the television opinion by booing anything from our side and cheering for things on the other side. You know, and we had been through that twice when Michael Madden was talking about shooting us down. We were like, oh no, we, this was killing us. We don't want to be in this position. 
So, um, long story short, what ended up happening is, you know, uh, Midwest Generation started looking at options themselves to where they kind of salvaged it and just closed down anyway because they were in the middle of a war between how to shut them down. And there weren't really too many people arguing about how to actually keep them there. <coughs> so, um, so what I beat, so I was saying, was it, um, I think it was in February, you know, when I when they you know had a meeting with Chicago King Power Ordinance and said uh we're getting close on time. Yeah, he's blowing the horn. What did you say? Does he's blowing the horn for us to come next Oh, said. okay. Five yeah, yeah, you know. Was, oh, five minutes? Okay, you know what? I'm gonna cut to another part real quick, just trying to make it real short about framing the message and talking to people from the opposite side. When we were doing this, we were also fighting tar sand pipeline. Okay, tar sand pipeline going from Canada is gonna run through Illinois, people don't know this, through Leroy, Illinois, and go all the way down to Texas. So we have to figure out, all right, listen, we have different people along the demographic along there. In Chicago, we had a lot of blue people. But we're in Illinois. Red, we found out they were supposed to have to vote for anybody on the left in something like 35 years. I mean, last time they voted someone on the left was before the 64 Civil Rights Bill, which that first thing that tells me is you all switched because of the Civil Rights Bill, which means that I can't go down there canvassing. <laughs> you know? We can't, I can't go, some of the women we had who obviously probably, you know, were, you know, with some of our gay and lesbian women, you can't go either, and I can't go. And we were some of the people that were putting this together, so we had to try to recruit some people that would appeal to what those people were more familiar with looking at when going down there. And we had to find out what they liked, what their desires were, and how to frame this whole tar sand pipeline thing as being for something that appeals to them. And I had black folks I was dealing with, they didn't want to let go of global warming for nothing. They wanted to go in there and try to convince everybody about how this is bad for global warming. I'm telling them, I, you don't watch Fox News or like Limbaugh, they program these people. So as soon as you say global warming, blinders come up, they don't hear anything else. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And now we're going to be arguing about whether global warming is real or not. Yeah. I don't have time to argue about whether global warming is real or not. Yeah. This, these people are trying to get this thing down here quick. You know, and there's all kinds of little fights going on. I have to get these people to support our this agenda without scaring them with liber, blue blue left wing liberal stuff. I can't say clean energy; they that's a sign of global warming. That's a sign of some liberal or something, you know. So we start looking at the situation, saw that okay, now this pipeline comes through there. They need eminent domain to take the farmers' land from. Them. You know, right wing people don't like government taking anything from anybody. Okay, so now we got the, we got now we got the eminent, eminent domain. Right wing people, you know, they're like they're like xenophobic a lot. They don't like foreigners and folks across borders and whatnot, you know. So they figure, hey, listen, this Canadian company, you know, they're going to use eminent domain to take your land from you, okay? They're going to use the, use the United States government to take their land from you and give it to a Canadian company, okay? So they can take this pipeline and run it to Texas. And what are they going to do down in Texas? They're down to the Gulf of Mexico. They're going to ship it out. They're going to ship it overseas. You know, so now I didn't say clean, I didn't say clean energy, I didn't say global warming, I didn't say any of those things that would trigger the horse of blindness to pop up. I appealed all the way to their right wing ideology and those people got mad as hell. Okay, and now they're ready now they were ready. They started getting the attorneys and they were starting to and there were actually people down there had attorneys they were trying to fight it a little bit, but they didn't have that many people to kind of gather around them. But now since we use that type of messaging to just to appeal to their belief system, their ideology based on their environment and the world that they see it, now we have them supporting inadvertently a clean and green energy agenda without even knowing. You know, <laughs> but it's based on their belief. And I was trying to tell people, and there's people there, they were like, we have to tell people about global warming. I'm like, you don't do that down there. Okay, you're gonna do that down there, people are gonna be shutting the doors and calling us all kinds of names, and now you're like, you can't do that. You gotta look like them, you gotta talk to them, talk, and you gotta frame this in the way that they actually see it so we can get them on our side. And some of that takes research, some of that takes listening to them while I, I listen and watch more right wing media probably than anybody, probably in my whole area in Chicago. A lot of people say, I don't wanna hear that, I don't wanna see that. So, how do you know this is how they organize against us? And this is how they program the masses? And this is how they're shifting people over in this direction? Okay, I need to know what it is my opponent is doing against me so I can figure out how to counter that.
But if I decide to not want to watch any popular culture, no media at all, or talk to them about anything, then I don't know what it is they're doing. If I'm trying to organize to get people on my side without knowing how my opponent is arguing against me, this is how a lot of failure happens. Anyway, because that's short. That's it. Oh, actually, no, we are over time anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Before we leave, because I know this was important to a lot of folks, uh, keep talking about in the context of this, as you go out there and you have more conversations of the kinds of energies, right? The bike uh, and getting your destination. How you gotta work harder because if right on the on the on the conveyor belt, what happens if you stand there? A lot of people you're talking to are like, well, I'm just gonna stay here, I'm good where I'm at. They don't realize, right, that that's taking everybody backwards, right? because you can't be neutral on a moving train, right? Exactly. Uh, so that's what the escalations are for, and this is like a whole other like five hour thing, right? But when you're talking about your escalations, right, you're talking about how you're gonna start, right, and how you're gonna finish at that exclamation point, your timeline. So you, you build the whole comprehensive campaign timeline into your escalation plan, right? That's really the point. So when you're talking about your escalations, use your comprehensive campaign timeline, right? To get to a point where you're you're agitating, you're organizing, you're moving up from your uh, uh, your values, right, to your actions, right, that are going to help you reach your goals. And when you do that, uh, you're going to find a point of of plateau for a while, right, and that's your maximized area of conflict. Right after that plateau is when you win, right. And the, Gandhi spoke about this in a different way, right? According to each of these steps is when they ignore you, and then they laugh at you, and then they fight you, and then you win. You win. Right? So your escalations can be, you can integrate all of that with your comprehensive campaign strategy timeline, uh, and make your, the timeline of your escalation all about this. What are we going to do this? How all those actions he was talking about, those were escalations. They have a role in the timeline. There's a place for them to get you from your values to your goals. You know what I want to also point out? Because I have a, there's another tool that we have called like escalation and how to color code your escalation. And what, one thing I like about what he, something similar to what he always talked about was in that other, in, well, 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 I don't think it's up there anymore. What, what about organizing backwards, thinking backwards? Oh yeah, the time oh, yeah. when it comes to figuring out well, how you want to do your escalation, find out what everyone's comfortable with in the red zone. Red zone is when we're, we're on buildings, dropping banners, blockades, locked by me, we're dead, whatever, we're pretty angry. We, we're beyond the simple stuff. Find out what everyone is willing to risk as far as that before it even starts. Red zone might be six months from now, but find that out because I've seen too many times where we're getting green and going through the yellow, we're getting through red, and you got like a split of people that don't agree with what you want to do in the red zone. They don't want to do that. Okay, now you have some people that want to do that, and now you're fighting and arguing about what you can do now that we're in the red, you know, so. Try to find out before you even start. Say, hey, listen, I'm wild and crazy, and when we get to this, this is a list of things that I'm going to be trying to do. That's so, where you go use your consensus <laughs> process, your action right. yeah. training. Right, <laughs> right there. Right. So you yeah. find yeah. out what we all agree with so that when we get there, everyone's on the same page. Don't have to worry about having a minority of people blocking us on the vote all the time. Seattle, we're going to get ready to do that.